Welcome to another session in which we'll continue to explore the works of English novelist Charles Dickens. This time our subject is his 1859 novel, A Tale of Two Cities, a fictional account of the violence and martyrdom of the French Revolution. By the time Dickens wrote A Tale of Two Cities, he was already a successful and famous novelist. Among the works he'd published in the preceding 20 years were The Pickwick Papers, Oliver Twist, Nicholas Nickleby, A Christmas Carol, David Copperfield, Bleak House, and Little Dorrit. A Tale of Two Cities was written near the end of his career at the age of 47, and 11 years before his death. Only one more truly popular book would follow it, Great Expectations. A Tale of Two Cities is set both in London and Paris, thus the title. It covers a decade before and during the French Revolution, from about 1789 to 1799. The story is part love story, part social history. It tells about the romance between the son of a French aristocrat and an English girl, and a young English barrister who sacrifices his life for their happiness. This drama develops against the backdrop of events that led to the revolution, the heartless exploitation of the poor by the French nobility, and the bloody and merciless vengeance those poor extract. Dickens received the inspiration for his story while acting in a play, and drew on the writings of Scottish historian Thomas Carlyle. Carlyle's book, The French Revolution, had made a deep impression on the public, and Dickens was no exception. He kept it by his bed, and it served, along with one other small book called Tableau de Paris, as his main source of information about the Revolution, and about the city of Paris at the time of the uprising. Dickens even asked Carlyle to send him some of the references quoted in his book, and Carlyle, in a moment of whimsy, sent him two carloads of books. Dickens read all of them. But the Dickens' approach to history was never that of the scholar. It was that of the storyteller. He used the factual information of Carlyle and others to create a stirring tale about people, both innocent and guilty, who were caught up in the maelstrom of social change. It's a reflection of this great talent that Dickens was able to fashion a completely credible and compelling story about events and places of which he originally knew almost nothing. Even Paris was largely unfamiliar to him. Although he traveled extensively, particularly on his reading tours, his travels concentrated on England, Scotland, and America. Although Dickens based his story on key historical events, he also omits many of the causes and forces that led to the revolution, out of necessity of focusing on individual and personal stories. The book makes no reference to Rousseau, whose writings formed the intellectual basis of the revolution, nor of leading figures in the uprising, such as Marat and Robespierre. Instead, Dickens zeroes in on the common people themselves, the peasant whose child is killed under the wheels of an aristocrat's cart, the vengeful old woman whose entire family has been killed by the aristocrats. His aim isn't to provide an accurate political history, but a moving story, and that he fully accomplishes. Unlike an historian or a social analyst, Dickens is not aloof from the story he tells. The book is filled with passion, and it's clear that Dickens himself, who fought against social injustice his entire life, was deeply affected by the events which took place almost a hundred years before in France. Like many of Dickens' books, including David Copperfield, which we explored in our last session, A Tale of Two Cities was originally serialized, with a different segment published each month. So the structure of the story conforms to the requirements of serialization. Each chapter had to stand on its own, and ends with a so-called cliffhanger, a problem or question that promises to be resolved in the next installment. In the actual style of A Tale of Two Cities, Dickens makes a departure from his previous works. For one thing, there are far fewer characters involved. Where David Copperfield had perhaps 20 to 30 significant players, A Tale of Two Cities has only a half dozen or so. The plot is also less cluttered. No event or incident is extraneous. Each has a clear purpose in moving the story forward. Dickens' writing is tighter and more concise, with none of the detours and ramblings that mark his earlier works. This is because, unlike previous novels, 
A Tale of Two Cities is focused on plot rather than character. The characters exist only to serve the story, and not the other way around. In fact, some of the characters are only partially developed, and to critics seem shallow or unsubstantial. The exceptions are Sidney Carton, the Englishman who sacrifices his life for the happiness of the woman he loves, and whose character undergoes a dramatic transformation as the story unfolds. And Madame Defarge, a classic Dickens villain whose bloodthirsty obsession with revenge is richly portrayed and quite terrifying. The other characters, however, seem somewhat flat. It was the sacrifice Dickens made to the narrative, a sacrifice that resulted in a narrative that is gripping and mesmerizing from start to finish. More than one reader has stayed up all night with *The Tale of Two Cities*, unable to put it down until the story was resolved. When it is resolved, Dickens gives us one of the most memorable and heart-wrenching endings in the history of literature. Part of what makes *A Tale of Two Cities* so compelling, besides the story itself, is the strength with which Dickens evokes the atmosphere of the time. He vividly captures the tension, the raging emotions, the squalor of the streets, and the arrogance of the nobility. He describes Paris masterfully and in detail, even though the city was alien to him. In fact, Paris is the main setting of the novel, and very little of dramatic consequence happens in London, in spite of the book's title. Nevertheless, the famous opening line of *A Tale of Two Cities*: "It was the best of times; it was the worst of times." Brilliantly recreates the mood of the times in both England and France. Another trait that separates *A Tale of Two Cities* from Dickens' other works is its lack of humor. Readers had come to love the comic characters and humorous incidents that distinguished his other books, and some were disappointed at the relentless seriousness of this novel. But that seriousness is appropriate to the mood and story, and strong humor would have seemed out of place. This demand for consistency is, of course, a burden almost all great writers have had to bear. Once the public becomes accustomed to a certain style, attempts by the writer to explore other styles and diversify his talents are seen as betrayal. It's been well over a century since *A Tale of Two Cities* appeared, and time has given testament to the success of the novel, whatever its perceived shortcomings. It's been read and loved by millions of people, and will probably continue to be. The story has fascinated filmmakers who have produced several versions of it. The best being the 1935 version, which starred Ronald Coleman as the selfless and noble Sidney Carton. There is no doubt that Charles Dickens accomplished what he set out to do: create a story so powerful that even the most passive reader would be swept up and transported by it. Soon we'll take you through the story step by step. But first, let's meet the main characters of the book. They include Doctor Manet. A French physician who has been wrongfully imprisoned in the Bastille for 18 years. As the story opens, he's just been released and is about to be reunited with his only child, a daughter he hasn't seen since her infancy. Manet has been in solitary confinement for his entire prison term, and he's now a mere shell of a man, emotionally fragile and helpless. His daughter patiently and lovingly helps him to recover. Lucy Manet, Doctor Manet's beautiful but modest daughter, she has no memory of the father she's about to meet. Her English mother died only two years after her father was imprisoned, and she was raised in England by a guardian. Only seventeen years old when we meet her, Lucy is a tender and compassionate character who also displays strength in times of crisis. Charles Darnay. The son of a French aristocratic family, who has repudiated his title and emigrated to England, he and Lucy fall in love. Darnay is a good man and a pivotal character, but he's less distinctive than other personalities in the book. Sidney Carton, a law clerk who coincidentally bears a strong physical resemblance to Charles Darnay, but whose character is completely different. Carton is slovenly and somewhat debauched, intelligent but bored. Even disgusted with life, he too is in love with Lucy. Jarvis Lorry, the very efficient representative of Telson and Company, an English banking house, he was a friend of the Manets and was named Lucy's guardian upon her mother's death. He raised her with the help of his loving housekeeper, Miss Pross. Lorry describes himself as a mere machine, but as the story unfolds, so does his warmth and integrity. 
Miss Pross. Pross is the typical no-nonsense English governess who's raised Lucy Monet and who adores her. Despite a gruff exterior, Miss Pross sees good in everyone except the evil Madame Defarge, who is bent on destroying all Miss Pross loves most. It is the brave Miss Pross who eventually confronts Defarge and brings on her end. Madame Defarge, a French peasant woman embittered against the aristocracy and active in the revolution. Her trademark is her knitting. She is always knitting, and it turns out she is knitting the names of all the aristocrats who have committed crimes against the people. When the time comes for revenge, Defarge's thirst for blood is insatiable. She particularly wants to see Charles Darnay's head roll, then decides she must have Lucy and Doctor Manet as well. Is Madame Defarge successful? To find out, follow us now as we begin the story of. A Tale of Two Cities. The story begins with Dickens' famous description of the period in which the tale takes place. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil, in the superlative degree of comparison only. Against this descriptive background, we find Mr. Jarvis Lorry in a coach, headed from London to Paris on a matter of business. It's a cold and foggy night in late November, and throughout the evening, Jarvis is haunted by an apparition. It's a vision of his friend, Doctor Manet, a French physician who is the father of Laurie's ward, Lucy Manet. The doctor had disappeared eighteen years before in France, and his young English wife died two years later after an exhaustive search for him. Their young daughter Lucy was returned to England and left in Mister Laurie's care. He, in turn, had put her in the capable hands of his housekeeper, Miss Pross. Miss Pross adores Lucy. Under her care, Lucy has grown into a beautiful and gentle young woman. And now, Mister Lorry has been sent by his company to bring her father, Doctor Manet, home. But first, he is to stop at Dover and meet up with Miss Pross and Lucy. Lucy has been told by an official of Lorry's bank simply that she must go to Paris on business concerning her father. She's been warned that the business is of a surprising nature. It is Mister Lorry who tells Lucy that her father has been found alive. It seems he's been a political prisoner in France all these years, a victim of a lettre de cachet, the infamous document by which a French nobleman could have anyone he named imprisoned without reason or cause. Mister Lorry's hoping Lucy can help restore the old man to life. The shock of going to meet her long-lost father is so strong that poor Lucy can only gasp, "I'm going to see his ghost. It will be his ghost, not him." Upset by the fact that she's been free and happy during all the years he was suffering, Lucy falls into a daze. It's the wild-looking, red-haired Miss Pross who rushes to her side and tenderly soothes her. Once in Paris, Mister Lorry goes directly to the wine shop of Monsieur Defarge. A former servant of Doctor Manet's, who is now looking after him, outside the shop, a wine cask falls to the pavement and shatters. A large crowd rushes forth, and using whatever means they can—cups, hands, even handkerchiefs—the people dip into the wine and squeeze the drink into the dry mouths of their children. For these people who live on dry bread crusts and water, the spilled wine is a cause of celebration. One citizen named Gaspar. Takes his wine-soaked fingers and scribbles the word "blood" on a wall. All the people look starved, with desperate eyes. The shops of the street are almost empty of food. In the sausage shop, only dog meat is available. Monsieur Defarge emerges from his shop, picks up a handful of mud, and obliterates the word "blood" that Gaspar has written. It is too soon. The little group from England enters the Defarge wine shop. They see Madame Defarge sitting behind the counter knitting. She has strong features and watchful eyes. 
three men standing nearby are having a conversation with Defarge. They all refer to each other by the same name, Jacques. They are clearly members of a conspiracy. The men leave, and Defarge takes Mr. Lorry, Lucy, and Miss Pross to an attic to see Dr. Manet. On the way, his anger rises. Is he greatly changed? asks Mr. Lorry. Changed, Defarge answers, and he mutters a curse, then strikes the wall with his hand. Mr. Lorry asks why they keep Manet locked up, and Defarge says, Because he has lived so long locked up that he would be frightened, rave, tear himself to pieces, die, if his door was left open. As they reach Manet's attic room, the three Jacques are leaving, and Lorry, angry, asks Defarge if he puts Manet on show. Defarge responds that he shows Manet to certain men to whom the sight is likely to do good. They open the door, and as Lucy foretold, Manet seems little more than a ghost. The thin, white-haired man is bent over a shoemaker's bench, and seems unaware of the activity around him. He took up the trade in prison, and now thinks of himself only as a shoemaker. All memory of his previous existence is gone. Manet is thin and withered, with a white beard and hollow eyes. Defarge has been using the sight of the pathetic man to inflame his co-conspirators. When asked his name, Manet says, 105 North Tower. When Lucy approaches him, a flicker of recognition seems to cross his face. He touches her golden hair. Then he takes a folded rag hanging from a string around his neck and opens it. Inside are a few golden hairs, and they match Lucy's. He remembers the night he was taken to prison. He found the strands of hair on his shoulder, left there when his daughter embraced him as she departed home that night. The confused old man tears at his hair in a frenzy, but Lucy calms him, vowing to nurse him back to health, and asking for his blessings. The group then boards a coach and sets out for England. Lucy is so understanding and loving towards her father that everyone feels assured she'll be able to work miracles and bring him back to his former self. Five years pass. Lucy has indeed restored her father to health and wholeness. They live in a modest house with Miss Pross, and Dr. Manet has a small medical practice. One day, Lucy and her father are called as witnesses to an English court where a young Frenchman named Charles Darnay is on trial for treason. It's a serious charge. Treason is a crime punishable by quartering, a brutal practice in which the victim is half-hanged, then decapitated, then his body cut into quarters. The defendant, Darnay, is accused of being a French spy. He's a handsome man of about 25, and is clearly a gentleman. Laurie, Lucy, and her father have been called as witnesses because they all met him on the boat to England five years ago when they left France. Lucy is filled with compassion when she looks at the accused. The chief witness is a friend of the accused, a man named Barsad, who says he's turning his friend in for the good of the country. Also watching the proceedings is another young man, a lawyer's clerk named Sidney Carton. Carton is immediately struck by the astounding physical resemblance between he and Darnay. When Lucy is called as a witness, she's unhappy to testify. She says she did meet Darnay on the boat, and that he was a kind man who told her he has business which requires him to travel frequently between England and France. Charles Darnay is shaken listening to Lucy's gentle and compassionate testimony. Next, when a key witness identifies Darnay as the man he's seen gathering information at a dockyard, Carton discredits the witness by pointing out that in the very courtroom sits another who could be mistaken for Darnay, he himself. The jury leaves to decide the verdict, and Lucy faints. It's Sidney Carton who procures help for her. Darnay asks Carton to take Lucy the message that he's sorry to have caused her such distress, and Carton agrees to do it. When the jury returns, Darnay is acquitted. During the congratulations that follow the verdict, Dr. Manet looks at Darnay with an expression of fear and doubt. It seems as if an old memory has been rekindled. After the trial, Carton and Darnay go out for a drink together, but Carton makes it clear he doesn't like Darnay. He says, I am a disappointed drudge, sir. I care for no man on earth, and no man on earth cares for me. After Darnay leaves... Carton tells himself that Darnay, who looks so much like him, only reminds him of what he could have been. 
He has a pint of wine for consolation. During the trial, both Carton and Darnay have become infatuated with the lovely Lucy. From that time on, they often visit the Manet house, where they can enjoy the company of the good doctor, now fully recovered, and can admire his attentive daughter. Although they bear a striking likeness, Darnay and Carton are of very different temperaments. Darnay, who has turned his back on an aristocratic name and title, is nevertheless refined, courtly, and confident. In contrast, Carton is a man who has doomed himself to failure. He drinks heavily, is slovenly and morose. He's an intelligent man, but he's always used his intelligence to help others succeed, never for his own success. He has no belief in himself. Lucy is kind to both men, but it's obvious she favors Darnay. Across the Channel in France, the unrest of the peasants is becoming an increasingly dark cloud. The climate is ominous, and the ruling class seems oblivious. One nobleman, the Marquis de Evremont, is on his way home from an extravagant ball. A child is crushed beneath the wheels of his coach, and, completely unconcerned, he tosses a gold coin to the sobbing father, whose name is Gaspard. The Marquis yells, It is extraordinary to me that you people cannot take care of yourselves and your children. One or the other of you is forever in the way. How do I know what injury you've done my horses? Monsieur Defarge whispers to Gaspard to be brave, and says it's better for his child to die so than to live. This pleases the Marquis, who throws Defarge a coin too, but the coin is thrown back into the coach. Madame Defarge, watching all, is stitching a record of it into her knitting. That evening the Marquis receives a visitor from England to his grand chateau. It's his nephew, a man we've seen before. He's none other than Charles Darnay. The two have great hostility towards each other. Darnay has come once again to persuade his uncle to work towards improving the life of the peasantry. It's a promise he made to his mother on her deathbed. He tells his uncle the name of Evremond is probably the most detested name in France, to which his uncle replies, Let us hope so. Detestation of the high is the involuntary homage of the low. Charles tells his uncle he has renounced his name and heritage and is taking refuge in England. The Marquis asks if he's run across another refugee, a doctor with a daughter. Charles says he has, but when he questions his uncle about them, his uncle refuses to answer. The audience is at an end, and Charles leaves. The next day the Marquis is found slain in his bed, a knife in his heart. Wrapped around the knife is a note that says, Drive him fast to his tomb. This from Jacques. The peasants know it is the deed of Gaspar, father of the slain child. Unrest is soon to become revolt. In England, a year later, Darnay approaches Dr. Manet and reveals his love for Lucy. Manet seems upset by the news, but promises to give his blessings if Lucy says she loves Darnay. Darnay says he wants to tell Manet his true name, but Manet, overcome with fear and dread, yells, Stop! He asked Darnay to tell him his name only if there is to be a wedding, and then, on that morning, he may confess. Sidney Carton is in love, too, but he knows he is unworthy of Lucy, and although he has had ideas of reforming, he feels such dreams are hopeless. He confesses his love to Lucy, and she weeps. He tells her he wants nothing in return for his love. It's too late for even her love to redeem him. But he finishes his confession with a promise. It is useless to say it, I know, but for you, and for any dear to you, I would do anything. Think now and then that there is a man who would give his life to keep a life you love beside you. In the Defarge's wine shop in Paris, five conspirators, all named Jacques, are meeting with Defarge. One of them tells the story of how Gaspar, the man whose child was killed under the wheels of the Marquis de Abramont's cart, has been hanged for the crime of killing the Marquis. There was a petition submitted to the king asking for Gaspar's clemency, because he'd been maddened by the death of his child. But instead, Gaspard was hung to serve as a lesson to all. At the meeting, the conspirators vote and unanimously agree. The Chateau of Evremond and all its race shall be doomed to destruction. Madame Defarge shall register their names in her knitting. When a passer-by once asks Madame Defarge what she's knitting, she replies, Shrouds. 
The Defarges hear a new royal spy has been named to their quarter. Madame Defarge sets out to record his name, too, in her knitting. He's an Englishman named Barsad. We recognize the name. He was one of the witnesses at Darnay's trial, who falsely accused Darnay of being a spy. Later, Barsad visits the shop of the Defarges, now leaders of the underground conspiracy that will soon give the signal to start the revolution. When he enters, Madame Defarge immediately puts a rose in her hair, and all other patrons, knowing the signal, quickly depart. Barsad tries to trap her into giving information about the unrest of the peasants, but she tells him nothing. Monsieur Defarge enters just as Barsad is saying that an old friend of the Defarges, Dr. Manet, is about to see his daughter married to the nephew of the late Marquis. Defarge seems affected by the news. His hands shake, and it's difficult to light his pipe. The spy makes a mental note of it and leaves. Defarge tells his wife how strange it is that the future husband of their friend's daughter is currently having his name knitted into her death list. But Madame Defarge responds, Her husband's destiny will take him where he is to go, and will lead him to the end that is to end him. That is all I know. In England, Lucy is picked up on the unease her father is feeling, but she can't discover the source of it. On the day he and Lucy are to marry, Darnay tells Manet his true identity. The doctor emerges from the room, deathly pale. Then Lucy and Charles marry and leave for their honeymoon. The confession of Charles Darnay has jolted Dr. Manet, and he's once again regressed to his shoemaker state. As he hammers, he seems to be trying to resolve something. Laurie leaves his work at the bank to tend to Manet, along with Miss Pross. After nine days, Manet recovers, and when told of his relapse, of which he has no memory, he hesitatingly agrees to have the shoemaking equipment destroyed. When the newlyweds arrive home, Sidney Carton comes to offer congratulations and asks Darnay if they can be friends. Darnay is glad to agree. That night, when Darnay describes Carton to Lucy as a man who is reckless and careless, Lucy begs him to be kind. She expresses her faith that Carton is, in her words, capable of good things, gentle things, even magnanimous things. Years pass and there is both sadness and joy for Lucy and Charles. Lucy gives birth to a girl, whom they also name Lucy, but then she gives birth to a boy who dies young. Carton visits perhaps six times a year, and he's always sober on these occasions. He's the first stranger to whom little Lucy holds out her arms, and he remains close to the child. Lucy and Darnay are happy, but always they sense a menacing cloud in the background looming ever nearer. Finally, in 1789, France explodes into revolution. The long centuries of cruelty and indifference towards the starving peasants at last demand justice. In Paris, Madame Defarge is a leader in the revolt. Her entire family was destroyed by the aristocracy, and since girlhood she has lived for revenge. On July 14th, a mob gathers at the wine shop and pushes on towards the Bastille, where they storm the gates. Defarge goes to the cell where number 105 North Tower was incarcerated. For 18 years, it was the cage of his friend Dr. Manet. The crowd attacks the governor of the Bastille with knives and fists. When he falls, Madame Defarge places her foot on his neck and lops off his head. The crowd surges on, and soon there are seven heads held aloft on pikes. They continue their rampage the next day, slaying more aristocrats and carrying their impaled heads and hearts through the streets. The violence spreads further and further. The Chateau of Evremont is burned to the ground. Soon every village and city in France is swept by the tide of violence. Madame Defarge takes forth her knitting. Now it is a death list. Her denunciations are rapid and furious. For almost her entire life she's been recording the names of those who have committed crimes against the people, and now it's her moment. The names come forward, and the victims are herded off to prison. Later they're given mock trials and sentenced almost always to death. Three years have passed, and many nobles have fled France for their lives, taking whatever valuables they could with them. Mr. Lorry is kept busy at the bank, which has many French customers and connections. 
he's asked to travel to Paris to straighten out the bank's chaotic affairs there. On the day he is to leave, Darnay is at the bank and overhears a superior telling Mr. Lorry there is a letter there addressed to the Marquis saint Evrimond. Does Mr. Lorry know who he is? Mr. Lorry doesn't know, but Darnay does. He says he's acquainted with the man and will take the letter to him. Since the day he told Dr. Manet his true identity, the two have kept it a secret, even from Lucy. Charles reads the letter in privacy. It's from a solicitor of his family who's been arrested and threatened with death for serving the aristocracy. Darnay vows to go to France and attempt to save the man's life. He leaves a note for Lucy while she's out and heads for Paris. But as soon as Darnay sets foot in France, he becomes aware of the danger of his journey. Because he's an emigrant, he must hire guards to protect him on his travels to Paris. He's cursed and threatened all along the way. And as soon as he arrives in Paris, he's taken into custody and imprisoned. Darnay learns that even the king is imprisoned, and although this worries him, he's not as fearful as he should be. The mass executions at the guillotine have not yet begun. Darnay appeals to Defarge, friend of his father-in-law, to help free him. But Defarge replies, I will do nothing for you. My duty is to the country and its people. I am the sworn servant of both against you. Darnay is a prisoner in secret, as his documents say, but he's unsure what that means. He's led through a dark, gloomy cell that holds many others, all aristocrats. Their manners are still refined and elegant, and they struggle to maintain their wit and pride. The guards seem very coarse compared to those they guard. Darnay is then taken up a long staircase to a small cell that contains only a mattress and a table. The door is locked behind him. He paces and repeats over and over, He made shoes, he made shoes, to remind himself he must guard against insanity. When Lucy and her father discover what's happened to Charles, Dr. Manet is determined to go to France too. He believes that, as a former prisoner of the Bastille, he has the influence to get his son-in-law released. He rushes to Paris with his daughter and his granddaughter, little Lucy. There he's quickly accepted by the revolutionaries and taken to authorities who can be of help. But Charles, who's been identified for who he is, heir to the notorious house of Evremont, is now a target of Madame Defarge, and she blocks his release. Meanwhile, prisoners are being slaughtered in droves. From his window in Paris, Mr. Lorry can see the bloody grindstone where the revolutionaries sharpen their axes and knives. He can no longer look. Dr. Manet doesn't give up. He continues to try for Darnay's release. Madame Defarge visits Lucy and little Lucy and looks closely and coldly at them, particularly the child. Lucy begs her to use her influence to save her husband. Madame Defarge tells her that for many years the women of France have watched their husbands and children suffer. She says, Is it likely that the troubles of one wife and mother would be much to us now? When she leaves, Lucy and Mr. Lorry feel the dreadful woman has left a shadow upon them and on all their hopes. Now the king and queen have been beheaded. Carts filled with prisoners headed for the guillotine pass regularly in the streets. Dr. Manet, steady, strong, and determined, continues to work to free Charles. Meanwhile, Mr. Lorry has received a strange and unexpected visitor. It is Sidney Carton. He asks Mr. Lorry to keep his presence in Paris a secret. After fifteen months in prison, Charles is released, due to the perseverance and moving defense offered by his father-in-law. The family is ecstatic, but their happiness is short-lived. Four young men arrive the very same afternoon and arrest him again. They say three new accusers have pointed blame at him. At his trial, it turns out, two of the accusers are the Defarges, and the third is Dr. Manet himself. Meanwhile, Sidney Carton has encountered Barsad in a shop in Paris. The former witness at Charles Darnay's trial and former royal spy is now an official of the revolution, and is working as a spy for the jailers at the prison. Carton threatens to convince the revolutionary tribunal that Barsad is still a spy for England, unless Barsad will help him, and Barsad panicked, agrees. At Darnay's trial, the full story of Manet's imprisonment is revealed. 
The story was written by the doctor himself when he'd been in prison for ten years and was beginning to fear for his sanity. He had hidden the letter in a stone wall in his cell, and the KG Madame Defarge had discovered it on the day the Bastille was stormed. In his letter, Manet had named those responsible for his imprisonment. It was two brothers of the house of Evremond, Charles' father and uncle. They had him imprisoned because he knew they had caused the death of a young peasant woman and her brother. His letter ends with a fiery condemnation of the house and all its descendants. Thus, the poor Dr. Manet has unwittingly named his own son-in-law as an enemy of the revolution. And Charles, for the crimes of his ancestors, which he himself deplores, is sentenced to die on the guillotine within twenty-four hours. Lucy faints, and Sidney Carton carries her to her apartment, where he lays her down and whispers in her ear, A life you love. Then he departs. Dr. Manet tries once again to gain his release, to no avail. Now it is time for Sidney Carton to fulfill his promise to Lucy made many years ago. First he visits the Defarge wine shop, where he pretends to speak no French. He overhears their conversation. Madame Defarge now wants Lucy and little Lucy to die at the guillotine as well. It turns out the brother and sister the Evremonds killed, the murder of which Dr. Manet knew and that caused his imprisonment, was the murder of her own brother and sister. Monsieur Defarge tries to dissuade her from taking vengeance on Darnay's wife and child, but she tells him he could sooner stop wind and fire. Carton then takes to Mr. Lorry four passes out of France, his own and three others. He instructs him to have a carriage waiting the next afternoon to whisk Lucy, little Lucy, and Dr. Manet to safety. Then he looks up at Lucy's lighted window and breathes a farewell. On the day Darnay is to die, Carton arrives at his cell. His visit has been facilitated by the blackmailed Barsad. He tells Darnay to exchange clothes with him. Then he drugs him and has the spy carry him to the coach, where Lucy, Dr. Manet, and Mr. Lorry are waiting. Then he remains in Darnay's cell in his place. It is time for the condemned prisoners to assemble. Carton confidently responds to the name saint Evremond and proceeds to the place of execution. At the same time, Madame Defarge has decided to visit Lucy. She thinks that in Lucy's despair she may say something against the revolution, something Madame Defarge can use against her. There she finds only Miss Pross, who is planning to take a later carriage and overtake her friends before they reach the border. Neither woman speaks the other's language. Miss Pross blocks a door so that Madame Defarge cannot leave. Something tells Defarge that her quarry has flown, and she opens the doors to the bedrooms, finding all in disarray. She insists on looking behind the one door she hasn't tried, which Miss Pross is blocking. Miss Pross refuses. The two women struggle, one fortified by hate and one fortified by love. Defarge reaches for her pistol, and Miss Pross sees it and strikes at it. It fires, and Madame Defarge falls dead to the floor. Miss Pross rushes to her carriage and out of Paris. Six carts are carrying prisoners to the guillotine that day. The crowd, as usual, is enjoying the spectacle, and there's particular curiosity to see the aristocrat Evremond. He is pointed out, standing in the third tumbrel, giving comfort to a young girl next to him. The carts begin to empty, and heads begin to fall. When number 23 is called, Sidney Carton steps forward toward the spot where he will die in Darnay's place and fulfill his pledge to Lucy. As he's led to the guillotine, he says, It is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest I go to than I have ever known. Far away, five passengers in a coach are safely on their way to England. This is the moving and bittersweet ending to A Tale of Two Cities a book that tells a compelling story of man's inhumanity to man, and the courage and selflessness that can exist side by side with incredible cruelty. Sidney Carton is one of the grandest characters in literature, and his sacrifice for love, perhaps the only truly noble deed of his life, is one of the finest scenes in any of Dickens' works. 
There are those who think this novel held political significance to Dickens, that it's a work of social protest from a man who always despised social injustice and fought to right the wrongs in his own country. But the story itself far overpowers any political point of view. Instead, it's a story about vengeance and forgiveness, about ideology versus humanism, about love and hate and greed and sacrifice. There are empathetic characters on both sides, and there are scoundrels on both sides. In that sense, the story is timeless and universal. There's a great irony in the book, too. For the peasants, as so often happens with oppressed people, have become equally as callous and cruel as those they accuse. In effect, their cruelty is learned. And because it's based in vengeance, it even exceeds, in terms of brutality and bloodshed, the cruelty of the aristocracy. The hunger for revenge is what motivates all the French populace, and the massacres which ensue intoxicate them. With the spilling of blood, they experience power, for the first time in many years. And the more blood, the more powerful they feel. Here is the danger the revolution symbolizes. When the crusade for justice is overtaken by the lust for power and revenge, then the cause, and man himself, has lost nobility. But there is still hope. That hope rests in the individual. The single man or woman who can, amid the chaos, demonstrate compassion, fairness, and selflessness. Individuals like Dr. Manet, Mr. Lorry, Miss Pross, and, of course, Sidney Carton. Thus, the ending of A Tale of Two Cities and its overall message is both bitter and sweet. For while we are left with the inspiring image of Carton's martyrdom and Darnay's escape, we are also left with the haunting image of the many innocent who did not escape. In our next session, we'll explore one more book written by Charles Dickens. For this last of his great novels, Dickens once again returned to his favorite setting, England, and his favorite subject, a young boy coming of age. This is the end of the session. Welcome to a new session of IntelliQuest's The World's 100 Greatest Books. In this session, we'll begin an exploration of the three most important works of the Victorian novelist Charles Dickens. Those works are David Copperfield, written in 1850, A Tale of Two Cities, written in 1859, and Great Expectations, written in 1860. We'll consider these books in the order in which they were written, beginning with David Copperfield. Charles Dickens is regarded as one of the greatest English writers, and his name and stories are known to almost everyone in the Western world. Dickens' books, which have often been made into movies and plays, are distinctive for two important reasons. One, because they vividly describe the social conditions of the time, and two, because of their deep pathos and melodrama. Some of his books are also notable for their humor, and for Dickens' ability to create comic and eccentric characters with quirky names and humorous habits. Dickens' books have endured for over a century. They still sell well and are widely taught in literature classes, and are often performed in modern dramatizations. He's also been an inspiration to many accomplished writers who followed him, among them Dostoevsky and Kafka. Margaret Mitchell even paid homage to Dickens in her classic novel Gone with the Wind. There's a scene where a group of southern women read David Copperfield out loud to each other to distract themselves from the fact that their men have gone out to raid a shantytown to avenge an attempted rape of Scarlett O'Hara. Mitchell was recognizing the immense popularity of Dickens during his time, in this case the Civil War years, and the enduring ability his books have to hold and enthrall the reader. Dickens' novels are powerful because they accurately record the bleak conditions of Victorian England, and yet he always manages to bring hope and optimism to them. The settings of his various books have included ugly prisons and factories, orphanages, workhouses, the streets of the slums, and even a bloody and violent revolution. He uncovers for us the cruelty and harshness of his era, but he always does so with wit, satire, and a sense of compassion for the underdog. Dickens created villains who were greedy, deceitful, and even sadistic. But he also created heroes and heroines who were honest and good, and who eventually rose above the moral decay that surrounded them. 
often these heroes were children. One of Dickens' special talents was his ability to see life through the point of view of a child, and he did so with unmatched sensitivity and insight. David Copperfield is one of those books, for in the first half of the story, the hero is only a boy, and all we see and experience is filtered through his own innocent eyes. The entire book is written in the first person, as David, now a man, reflects on his life and the circumstances which formed his character. David Copperfield is the most autobiographical of any of Dickens' works. Many of the events in the story parallel events in Dickens' life, and some of the characters are drawn from characters he knew. In fact, by the end of the story, Copperfield has become a successful writer. The story begins right before David Copperfield is orphaned and follows him through school, a variety of jobs, and two marriages, until he finally attains success and contentment. On the way, he experiences many hardships, including the brutality of a cruel stepfather, a vicious headmaster, and the degradation of working as a child laborer. His great aunt comes to his rescue and sends him to a decent school. Later, he apprentices to a lawyer, whose daughter becomes a friend, and later his second wife. But his first marriage is unsuitable. His wife is flighty and childish, and David longs for someone who can understand and uplift him. When she dies and he remarries, his life at last seems to be going in the right direction. At the end of the book, he is happily pursuing a career as a writer and looks back on the tumultuous events that brought him to the present. In the process of describing Copperfield's life, Dickens also manages to become a social commentator and an energetic advocate of children's rights. The book includes descriptions of the worst abuses and inequities of his time. The terrible schools, child labor, debtors' prisons, unsanitary slums, and the general lack of respect and compassion for children, especially poor children. But these indictments aside, Dickens is foremost an entertainer, and the story, from beginning to end, is compelling and emotional. David Copperfield, like many of Dickens' works, was originally serialized. It was written in twenty parts, or episodes, and one was published each month. Those reading the novel can clearly see this. Each chapter has its own climax, and characters are often reintroduced to remind readers of who they are. When it was released, it wasn't as popular as Dickens' preceding works, probably because it was too realistic, and readers then preferred simple melodrama. Although the term realism wasn't applied to fiction until a few years later, David Copperfield, perhaps because it's partly autobiographical, is considered the most realistic of all Dickens' work. Now times have changed. In the 20th century, readers appreciate realism. David Copperfield proved to be Dickens' most popular book, and there are more copies of it, both hardbound and paperback, than any of his other works. It was also the favorite work of the author himself. Charles Dickens wrote, Of all the books I like this the best, like many fond parents, I have in my heart of hearts a favorite child, and his name is David Copperfield. The proud parent of David Copperfield was born in England on February 7, 1812, the second of eight children. Charles Dickens' father, a Navy clerk, was careless with money, and he was imprisoned for debt when young Charles was only twelve. It was the most significant and terrible event of Dickens' life. Even up until his death, it was a subject he could barely talk about. Dickens was taken out of school and put to work in a shoe dye factory. He lived alone in the attic of a lodging house, ashamed and fearful his parents had deserted him. Dickens' father soon came into an inheritance, and he was put back into school. At fifteen, he went to work in a law firm, and later he became a reporter, first of law cases, then of parliamentary proceedings. He was a hard and dedicated worker, and an astute observer. He began writing comic sketches, later entitled Sketches by Boz. The pseudonym Boz was suggested by his brother's pronunciation of Moses when he had a cold. In 1836, Dickens wrote the Pickwick Papers and was internationally famous within four months. At the same time, he became editor of a monthly magazine in which he began serializing Oliver Twist and later Nicholas Nickleby. He also married Catherine Hogarth, 
a marriage which produced ten children but was nevertheless a deeply unhappy marriage. The two finally separated twenty years later. In 1840, Dickens started a weekly periodical in which he published, among other works, The Old Curiosity Shop, a popular story that sold over 100,000 copies when released in book form. He also began...